Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our now 17th uh, global online seminar in biodiversity informatics. Um, we have the good fortune of having as our guest uh, Robin Engler. Um, I'll give you a, a little bit of a formal introduction, and then if, if Robin doesn't mind, I'll also give you a little bit of a preface just from my own standpoint. Um, Robin obtained a master's in science uh, with emphasis in plant ecology and GIS, and then went on to the University of Lausanne in 2005 and worked to a PhD uh, with Antoine Guisson. Um, PhD was focused on, on niche modeling and perhaps uh, particularly on, on methodologies for rare species. Um, those explorations eventually led him to the development of MIGCLIM, which is the subject of today's seminar. Uh, he's also worked as a, as a scientific collaborator for the Seismic Atlas of a basin in Switzerland. Um, and in 2014, he joined the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics to work on spatial epidemiology risk modeling. So I'm very pleased that, that Robin accepted to do this seminar. Um, I'll give you, again, my little preface is that um, one of the big problems in, in this, this field that we could call distributional ecology or, or uh, ecological niche modeling or whatever you prefer is that we are forever getting confused in, 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 in discords between what the niche tells us and what spatial considerations tell us. And so we've, we've got this perpetual problem of identifying areas that are not accessible or considering areas that are not accessible when we're identifying niches. And so we get into problem after problem. And so I, I personally would see the class of methods that Robin will be talking about as essentially the next generation of how we'll be doing these, these analyses. So I'm very excited about this seminar. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Robin and uh, he will give you both seminar and apparently a worked example uh, in R. So Robin, thank you very much and I'll turn everything over to you now. Hello, Tom. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me today on this uh, online seminar. And thank you very much, uh, Tom, for the nice introduction. Um, so, yeah, as, as uh, Tom explained, I'm, I'm now working at the Swiss Institute uh, for Bioinformatics. And over there is kind of a half research and kind of half uh, support for other scientists. So as Town explained, part of my, my research is, is doing uh, models for epidemiology. And uh, also a part of my work is, is supporting scientists. We are, we're running a high performance cluster there. And uh, we also quite a lot of work to help people uh, install software, help people run the, the their scripts or the computations. All right, so I think I will now start my presentation and share my screen. So if just feel free to interrupt me, Town, if if I'm doing something wrong. Let's see. Everything is going perfectly so far. Okay. All right, so now you should see my screen and the and the title of the of today's presentation, yes, uh, which is about the MIGCLIM R package. So it will is for seamless integration of dispersal constraints into um, projection of species distribution models, or what is also sometimes called uh, ecological niche models. Um, so before uh, getting starting, uh, started, sorry, I want to just acknowledge uh, two people in particular who helped me with with this work. Uh, the first person is uh, Bim Hojik. Uh, Bim is a he's a computer scientist, and he helped me uh, a lot to translate part of the of the MIGCLIM code 
uh, into C code to make it uh, both faster and more memory efficient. So I'm, I'm really thankful to, to them. And the other person is Antoine Guizon. As, uh, as Tan just told you before, he's, he was my supervisor during my, my PhD. So of course, he, he participated a lot, participated a lot sorry, in the development of uh, the MIGLIM model. Uh, all right, so just a short overview of the presentation. So I'll start uh, just by uh, giving you an overview of what is MIGLIM and why we, we developed it. Uh, then I will show you a few use cases of MIGLIM. Uh, then we'll have a look of how it, how it works in more details. And uh, finally, we'll have a, a brief example in, in R to uh, show you uh, what it looks like in, in real life. And uh, during the presentation, if you have questions, you can always uh, send them to the, the email address, uh, which you see right here. Uh, sorry. Uh, Biodivtraining at gmail.com. Or you can post them on, on Google+. Plus. And at the end of the, the presentation, uh, Town will will gather the, the question and, and I can answer, and answer them. All right, so what is McClim and why was it developed? Um, so the development of, of this tool uh, goes back to about uh, 2005 when I was studying my, my PhD. And at this time, I'm, I was working in Antoine Guizon's lab, so it's a spatial ecology lab, and we are working a lot with uh, all things related to, to niche models. And back then, uh, it was um, kind of the start of, of using the niche models to, to make a prediction of uh, what could be the, the potential impacts of climate change on uh, species distribution. There was a paper in 2004 uh, by Thomas and colleagues in, in Nature. And so this was kind of a bit of a hot topic at, at that time. So of course, we were also interested in, in applying this kind of uh, methodology. So how, how do we do, a, first a short introduction, how, how do you uh, project a species niche into uh, future conditions? So I think most of you will be quite familiar with uh, species distribution models. So I try to, to be a bit quick here. So first you need data. So you go in the field and you will collect uh, presence and absence uh, location for your target species. And you can then extract for each of these locations. You can uh, extract in your computer a number of uh, variables or predictors. For instance, uh, temperature, precipitation, soil, tem soil type, and uh, so forth. Uh, using niche modeling, you can then uh, relate uh, your presence absence to the environmental variables in order to uh, model the species ecological niche. Um, so generally, you would uh, calibrate this, this model in a statistical software like R, for instance. And when your, your niche model is ready, is, is tested and evaluated, you can then uh, project it onto your whole uh, study area and you obtain a map of potentially a suitable habitat, which you see here. All right, so that, that is, a, is a suitable habitat uh, under the climatic condition that you have uh, used to calibrate your model. So how do you project that in the future? Well, the methodology is, is fairly simple. So you just uh, replace your uh, current environmental variables with, uh, say, temperature and precipitation as forecasted by a global circulation model. So you re replace these layers and um, you project, you apply your model again and you obtain your new habitat suitability map under these uh, predicted future conditions. Uh, of course, this is, uh, it sounds uh, very easy, but in, in practice, uh, there are a lot of um, issues associated with uh, with this and uh, in particular you have things like um, uh, for instance uh, niche conservatism you are not sure that uh, your uh, the niche of your species as you model under current uh, climate condition will also be valid in the future and another problem that 
you have is uh, also that in fact when you you project uh, your niche into the the future what you obtain is not uh, the actual distribution of your species but is uh, the site that uh, might potentially be suitable but of course there is uh, nothing that uh, guarantees that uh, your your species will be effectively able to to reach all these areas that are uh, suitable for it in the or that are predicted as being uh, possibly suitable for it in the future. So here you can see an example of a, a landscape uh, with a, of course, is a, a fake example. So here I put the current distribution of of my species here down in the in the valley. And let's say I project my model into the future and I obtain these uh, red surfaces here, which is uh, so the future potential distribution. But as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of uh, problems can happen uh, when the, the species has to, to disperse. Uh, first of all, you could have uh, simply slow migration. So maybe your your species uh, is not migrating fast enough to, to reach all the locations that are suitable. You could also have, uh, as shown here, a uh, gap in suitable habitats that is larger than the, the dispersal distance. So for instance, uh, that red patch here at the top uh, might be difficult to reach because the species has, has to, to go over this uh, mountain ridge here. And finally, you could also have uh, something, a barrier that will uh, impede the species to, to disperse to certain areas uh, like here. So as you can see, uh, there, there are many reasons why you can have a discrepancy between uh, the future uh, potential distribution and uh, the actual uh, future distribution of the, of the species. So we developed the MIGCLIM for, for this very reason. It was to uh, integrate uh, dispersal constraints into the, into the project, uh, projection sorry, of niche models. So how, how do we go, go about to, to address this problem? Well, our take on on this issue was so so far you had like the your species distribution model here and then you applied under future condition and you obtain your prediction so the idea is uh, to add uh, an extra layer of modeling in between um, your um, i mean in between your niche model and the, and the prediction of future distribution and uh, this modeling layer should uh, take care of dispersal. And you would do this uh, through a number of parameters, such as uh, dispersal distance, so how far uh, can your species uh, disperse, like uh, life, uh, life cycle parameters, so for instance, uh, how long does it take for your species to, to reach uh, an age where it can produce propagules and, and reproduce, uh, landscape fragmentation and barriers to, to dispersal and maybe also sometimes some you can have a random and some dispersal events that are non-standard so the, the at a longer distance and happening a bit uh, randomly so this part of of dispersal in between the, the niche modeling and the final uh, distribution is exactly what uh, Miklim does and what what it was uh, designed for. So what is what is Mickling? So it's a, it's a cellular automaton that implements dispersal into projection of species distribution. Um, it includes a number of uh, dispersal parameters uh, that we will see in more details later on. And it was original, originally sorry, developed for projection under climate change, but you can, or you can also be applied for other type of modeling uh, where you also want to, to include dispersal. Uh, for instance, uh, for people modeling invasive species, uh, they might be interested to, to know uh, what are the, the potential routes uh, through which uh, a species might um, uh, disperse. Or also, for instance, they might be interested in in knowing uh, how long uh, might it take might, might might it take for a species to to uh, invade uh, certain areas so it's it's not only for uh, climate change 
<clears throat> so here is an example of a, a typical uh, modeling pipeline that you would use if you want to, to integrate uh, dispersal restrictions. Um, so first, here is the same as before. So you have uh, your presence data, your environmental data. You can uh, model your habitat suitability. You can evaluate your model. And then when you're happy with it, you can uh, project it. Uh, this is an example here where we are implementing some sort of uh, change in the en environment, such as, as climate change. So in that case, you would uh, generate a number of, of habitat suitability map for different points in time. For instance, here would be every five years from say 2010 to 2100. So you would have a, a number of uh, uh, habitat uh, suitability map for, for different points in time. And then you feed all this into uh, the dispersal modeling, so make claim, and you obtain uh, your final projection. Um, so in practice, how, how does uh, make claim look like? So when we started, <laughs> funnily enough, we, we actually uh, started to write uh, make claim as an extension for the ArcGIS software that some of you might might know. It is a, is a GIS, uh, GIS software. Uh, it was it was uh, funny to code in the beginning because you know every, everything was um, with a graphical user interface. But I quickly realized that. While it was uh, fun to code and fun to use, uh, the first time it very quickly became a, a pain to, to use this uh, graphical user interface because it takes uh, so much time to fill up all, all these formats. Uh, after you've done it a few times, you're really uh, fed up with it. And of course, there are also additional problems. Uh, for instance, uh, so Arcus is a proprietary software, so it, and it's, it's a fairly expensive at that. Um, so that was was not really a good thing either. Uh, plus, it was also difficult to to integrate uh, this software in a in a modeling pipeline where you would have everything in, in R. And it's also a software that you cannot uh, really easily run on on say a high performance cluster and that kind of uh, computing setup. So in 2012, uh, we decided that we, we want to rewrite uh, MicClaim as an R package this time. Um, and this is uh, where I said before, uh, where Vim really helped me a lot because the part of the code was at this time we rewrote it in, in C, uh, which uh, really helped to speed up things. Uh, so what are the advantages of, of, the, of the new uh, R package? Well, first, is a, it's an R package, so it's it's really easy to install. You can run it on uh, cluster type machines. It's open source, so everyone has has access to it and can can run it. It's uh, much faster than the the previous version uh, that was in ArcGIS, and it's also uh, more more flexible. So we uh, we added a support for for a number of uh, different um, raster formats. That you can give as a as input to to make claim. Okay, so after this uh, this short introduction, I will just give you a few example of of use cases of uh, make claim. Um, the first use case is uh, this paper we wrote in two thousand and nine with uh, with the people from the Antoine's uh, EcoSpat lab. So here we we wanted to um, carry out a projection of suitable habitat on the uh, climate change for 280 species in the Swiss uh, pre-Alps. So that is would be the the typical uh, use case uh, for which we we develop uh, MICLIM. So it's when you want to to carry out uh, projection on the future climatic condition. Um, you have a lot of species, so you need to, to be able to, to really automate things uh, to carry out all, all these projections. And you want to uh, account for, for dispersal. So, for instance, here you can see um, some of the results we obtained. Um, here the idea was, was that we compared, uh, for instance, 
uh, how many uh, species are projected projected sorry to to become extinct um, under different climatic scenarios that you see here a1 a2 b1 b2 and uh, we compared uh, different uh, dispersal scenarios so there would be no dispersal and uh, unlimited dispersal which basically means that you you do your niche modeling but you don't uh, include any either you you don't uh, include any dispersal at all or you simply consider that in unlimited dispersal that the entire uh, habitat that is uh, suitable that is projected as suitable in the future will will be able to be occupied by the species and then we have the, the two uh, scenarios here abbreviated SDD and LDD that were obtained uh, using MICLIM so in this case we we added uh, this uh, the dispersal restriction into into our model using MICLIM and you can see that uh, you obtain results that of course are somewhere between um, unlimited dispersal and, and no dispersal but, but the results uh, can be significantly different from from either scenario so you, you see the the interest of uh, accounting for for this person <clears throat> another use case that i that i found uh, was this paper by uh, normand et al in 2013 so they they make projection of trees and shrub species, species sorry, in Greenland, uh, again on the uh, climate change scenario. So that would be a use case that is uh, fairly similar to, to the one uh, I showed you just before. And again, uh, they wanted to, to account uh, for dis dispersal restrictions um, in the projection, so they, they used MICLIM to, to do that. Uh, here, another paper, uh, this time by Jimona and Poggio. Uh, this case is a little bit different. And uh, what they did here is that they, they wanted to look at the impact of uh, landscape fragmentation on a future distribution of, of species, I think it's in Scotland. So in that, in that case, uh, uh, MICLIM was really used to uh, to implement as a, um, I mean to account for the fact that the, uh, the landscape or the suitable habitat uh, can be can be fragmented. It is not always a, a simple uh, continuum, so it can be fragmented, and and this can uh, slow down the species. So here they they evaluated uh, how how much it it affects uh, the projections. Okay, so these are three. Uh, so these were three uh, uh, three examples of how uh, MICLIM uh, can be used. And uh, now we're gonna look a bit in more details uh, how the the model works, what are the, the parameters, and what kind of input it, it requires. Uh, so first, here's a a, sim a simplified uh, overview of the model. So you can see the, the different inputs that, we need, that you need to run the model. So of course, you need a, an initial distribution of your species. This is your, your starting point. So you have either a presence or absence of your, of your species. So this you would input as a, as a raster, as a, as a grid in R. Um, as the other input, you also need, of course, um, information on habitat suitability. So this you input through a number of uh, habitat suitability maps. And the number of, of maps uh, that you need is, is entirely uh, up to you, and it depends what you, what you want to model. Um, for instance, in the examples that I showed you before, uh, the, first, um, sorry, the first paper where we, we project uh, distribution of, of, the, of our 280 species in the the Swiss pre apps we we had, for instance, uh, habitat suitable map every five year from 2000 to 2100. So we had uh, 20 different uh, habitat suitability maps here. Uh, but in the case, if you were interested, for instance, in uh, 
in how uh, an invasive species will disperse. Uh, maybe all you need is, is simply one uh, one map for your uh, initial the initial location where you introduce your species, and one map uh, that will show what is the suitable habitat. So in that case, you would have only uh, one one input here, one map as as input here. Uh, other type of input is of course uh, dispersal parameters of your species. So you have to give a dispersal kernel. So how far can your species disperse, and uh, what are the probabilities of dispersal associated to to each uh, uh, to each distance? Um, you uh, you can this is, is optional. But you can give uh, how long it takes for your species to to reproduce. Um, for instance, how how does the uh, production uh, proper good production potential increase over time? And you can also optionally add uh, long distance dispersal events. Again, in that case, you have to give a frequency and a distance range for these events. But we'll see that in more details later. Um, now, this is uh, the part in blue. It's it's uh, the dispersal uh, modeling part itself. And here, what I would like to draw your attention on is uh, these two uh, nested loops. They're really important to understand. So you have the, the red uh, loop here, uh, which I call the environmental change loop. And the reason it, is that um, at each time this, uh, this loop starts, uh, the McLean will take uh, a new, will update basically the the habitat uh, suitability that it has with uh, the next map that you give to, to it. So of course, if you have just uh, one map, then you do this loop only one time. Let's say if you have uh, 20 maps, then you would do this loop 20 times. And nested within uh, this environmental change loop, you have a second loop, which is uh, the dispersal loop. So in, in that loop, uh, each time you, you perform this loop, um, you will have uh, one dispersal event. So all the, basically all the cells that are occupied uh, by your species uh, will have the chance to, to disperse uh, during this, um, this loop. So the reason why we, uh, we decoupled uh, the, the change in the environment from the dispersal is because when you run a, um, a uh, simulation of um, under climatic conditions, uh, for instance, as in the example for say from uh, 2000 to uh, 2100, uh, maybe you don't want to have a hundred. Uh, you don't want to to update your habitat suitability every year uh, because, as you know, the the projection that you obtain by the by the climate uh, models. Uh, there can be quite a lot of uh, variability, so probably you you prefer to to do some averaging over uh, several years. So, for instance, um, if you average every five years, uh, then you would you would uh, run uh, five dispersal loops and then one environmental change loop to update the suitably the habitat, and then you would run again uh, five dispersal loops that corresponds to to five years uh, before uh, running. Uh, um, and run to change loop again. Uh, to show you a bit more in a, maybe in a more graphical way how, how this works, I, I made here a little animation. Um, so here you can see a, is a hypothetical landscape uh, with a hypothetical uh, model species that looks like a sunflower right here on the bottom left corner. And the green cells are uh, suitable habitat, and um, the purple cells are unsuitable habitat. So in the beginning, um, we assume that our species is, is present on these four cells. And here on top, you can see a kind of uh, timeline um, where you will uh, always see where we are in the, in the simulation. So in the beginning, you see this uh, blue rectangle here. We are at the initial distribution. So during the, the first step, we have this uh, a change in the environment. So you saw now all these uh, 
these pixels that were purple here now turn turn green, which means uh, they, they were predicted as uh, becoming suitable. And now uh, this was an environmental change loop, and within this loop we have the dispersal loop. So our species is is going to to disperse. Uh, here I decided that uh, the species would be able to to disperse on a distance of uh, two cells. Um, so this is delimited by this uh, rect red uh, rectangle here. And as you can see uh, from the graphic here on the left, uh, the, the probability uh, for the species to, to colonize a new cell is uh, decreasing with distance. So for instance, this is why you can see uh, some of the cells, even though they are within dispersal distance, so they are within uh, the red rectangle. They did not become occupied uh, simply because by random chance uh, the species could, did not uh, disperse to these, these locations. <clears throat> and the four green cells here that are outside uh, the red uh, square, of course they don't uh, become, they cannot uh, be colonized by the species because uh, it's beyond uh, the dispersal distance of the species. All right, so in this uh, simulation, I, I decided that um, I would update my environment every second year. You can see this with the, the red arrows here on top. And every year, I will uh, simulate a dispersal. Um, so now I've in this um, in year number two, we only have dispersal. We don't have any uh, update in the environment. So you can see the uh, the blue plants that appeared here. That they are now the um, they represent the cells that became uh, occupied or colonized during this um, this step. All right. So next step is the year three. So now we have again an update in the environment, and you could see that uh, a lot of these uh, cells now turn green, which means they, they became suitable. And again, we have a uh, dispersal step, so you can see some of the cells uh, became occupied, and also not either because they're too far or just because randomly the species did not disperse there. Year four, we have again a, only a dispersal, so there is no update in the environment, so we have a a dispersal step, so you can see there are new, <clears throat> now these two cells here, for instance, they, they became occupied as well as these three here. In year five, we have again an update in the environment, so we have new cells uh, that turn green. Again, our species uh, can disperse, occupy new cells. In year six, uh, there is no update in the environment, but there's only a dispersal, so the species disperse. And sometimes uh, what can happen is, if you choose to, to implement it, is uh, that you can have <clears throat> what uh, we call a, a long distance dispersal event. Uh, so that would be a, a like random random event that is, that is uh, rare, but that sometimes happen where the species uh, will will disperse over a larger distance than usual. So, for instance, here uh, you have one propagule that uh, crossed somehow the river. Uh, maybe it was uh, carried by a strong wind, or maybe by an animal over the the bridge here, and somehow it it uh, randomly uh, landed on that cell here. On year seven, you have again uh, update in the environment, so new cells uh, become suitable, and the species can disperse. Year eight, sorry, oops. Uh, okay, that, that's the end. <laughs> sorry. So uh, basically, you you get the idea is is a is a succession is a, a succession of these uh, two nested loops. So sometimes you have uh, change in the environment. Um, so Miklin takes a new of your uh, input suitability maps, and uh, within this loop, you have a number of dispersal loops. So here, um, we have uh, 
a little bit uh, more complete view of the model with uh, a lot more information on the on the different inputs and this is a figure that you can also find in the in the MCLIM user guide. Um, so again, we have our uh, in, like species uh, initial distribution, our suitability suitability maps. Here you can uh, recognize the two loops as before. So you have the environmental change loop, the dispersal loop here. Um, the different uh, dispersal uh, parameters. And there are also some extra options that I, I didn't uh, discuss before. Uh, for instance, you have the option to to introduce uh, barriers to dispersal. So this is here is where you can account for, uh, for instance, the landscape fragmentation. Uh, for instance, say if you have a, a grass species that um, cannot uh, dispose to, through forest forested area, you you could uh, enter forest as a, a barrier to to dispersal, or maybe if you have a, a small mammal species, it might not be able to, to cross a, a large river, so you could you could enter the, the river as a as a barrier to to dispersal. Um, you also have another option, which is um, to reclassify um, your uh, habitat suitability. I will I will get back to that later. But uh, the most important point that I want to make on on this slide here is uh, that actually the, the dispersal is is divided in, in two kinds of dispersal. So you have a regular dispersal and you have long distance dispersal. Mm -hmm. So what is what is the difference and why do we have these two kinds of, of dispersals? So first you have a regular dispersal. So this is is uh, entered uh, via uh, uh, dispersal kernel that's a user inputs and basically it gives uh, the probability of a propagule to disperse to a given distance uh, from its source and as you can see here you can see two examples of uh, dispersals kernels so basically <coughs> the kernel is is discrete and the the distance units are, are cells so here you would have the probability so here is a hundred percent probability uh, that the species dispersed to a distance of one cell. Uh, you have a 0.4 probability that is dispersed to a distance of two cells, and so on. In this case here, you have a, a simpler uh, dispersal kernel where we just assume that uh, the species has a 100% chance to to disperse to any cell uh, located within a distance of uh, five five pixels, five cells. Uh, basically, here you can see the this is a, a top. Uh, top view of, of the of the landscape. So you have your uh, your source cell that is here, and uh, basically to to find what is the probability that the that the that the propagule is is dispersed at a given distance. So you the software will just measure the, the distance between your your source cell that is here and your sink cell that is your target cell that is here. And then they will look up uh, the dispersal kernel. Here is the red distance, and figure out what is uh, the probability associated to, to that distance. And for here, if you have a, say here is a three-cell distance in, in green, uh, uh, so the software just uh, see that this cell is at a distance of, of three three pixels from your your source cell, and it can uh, look up the associated probability. Um, so the, the dispersal kernel is is used is one of the, the inputs uh, used to compute the probability that a, a suitable but empty cell becomes colonized. So this is a the equation that is used to compute this this probability. Uh, as you can see, it depends on uh, mostly three things. So is uh, this p disp so the the probability from the dispersal kernel. So how likely is it that a that the propagule can dispose to this cell given its distance to, to other uh, source cells? Um, there's also the, the probability that source cells uh, produce propagules. As I, as I said in the beginning, um, this is one of the input parameters where you can say, for instance, uh, 
you know, it, it will take a uh, species, say, uh, five years before it starts uh, producing uh, propagules. So, for instance, during the five first years, this, this probability would be zero, and thus um, a new cell cannot be colonized. And finally, you also have uh, probability of habitat uh, invisibility. Sorry, I, I misspelled that. Uh, that I will also uh, come back on later on. First, for for the regular dispersal, and then you have. Uh, what I call long distance uh, dispersal. So the aim of <coughs> of this type of dispersal is is really to capture uh, rare and uh, non-standard uh, dispersal events. So, for instance, uh, if you think of a, an anemochorus species, or so a species that is dispersed by wind, the regular dispersal would be uh, would be based on on the wind. So, you know, like maybe this species can disperse to 100 meters. Uh, by, by wind, but maybe sometimes uh, what can happen is is that one of the seeds of this species is uh, somehow picked up by by an animal and then it gets uh, carried a lot further than 100 kilometers. Maybe it gets carried to two kilometers. But of course, this this happens uh, unfrequently, and uh, it happens uh, very at a very like a uh, random distance and uh, uh, in a random direction. Um, so for these long distance dispersal events, you have to you have to enter a frequency with uh, which they occur, and of course, um, also depend on how likely a, a source cell is is going to produce uh, propagules. Here to graphically illustrate the difference, so basically for regular dispersal, uh, you will have a, a source cell that uh, disperses with a certain probability in all directions here. Uh, versus uh, long distance dispersal on the right here, uh, where you have only one uh, event that happens with a certain frequency. And um, it will happen in a random direction and at a random uh, distance within a, a, specified, a user specified range of, of distances. <laughs> if you look at it as a as a kernel here, you have you have your uh, distance here that is uh, measured in, in pixels or in cells, and uh, your probability of, of uh, dispersal here. So in green, you would have the regular dispersal, so you have different probabilities associated to different distances, and uh, in red or in pink here, you have uh, long distance dispersal. So the <coughs> within, as I said, it's between a minimum distance and a maximum distance that the user can define and a given frequency, but this frequency is, is equal for all distances. So at this point, you could ask, OK, but, but why do I need uh, this uh, long distance dispersal? Because in fact, uh, I could just model this uh, kernel shape uh, with regular dispersal. I, just make a, I would just make a longer kernel and just add like very, very uh, tiny probabilities of, of dispersal to, to cells that are located uh, at, the, at the long distance. Well, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's totally possible to, uh, to do that. But the main uh, problem that you're going to face here is uh, that if you want to extend uh, this kernel to a very long distance, uh, you're quickly you're increasing exponentially the, the number of, uh, of cells that are within your like, search radius. Um, and this uh, will take a, a long time to, to compute. So the, the main reason to to use um, to have that we for the main reason for which we implemented uh, this long distance dispersal <coughs> is uh, for um, uh, for computing uh, time reason. So so it will allow you to to have um, long distance dispersal uh, while keeping a a reasonable uh, computing time because otherwise if you choose a, a very long uh, distance here for for these rare events your simulation is is never gonna gonna finish because it will will take uh, weeks or months or years to, to compute okay here is a, a short illustration on uh, how barriers to dispersal uh, work so 
they really work just like you, you would expect them to work. So you have a, a source cell here that is a occupied cell, sorry, here in, in black. And uh, say you want to, if you have a, a barrier here, it's, it's a, the striped cells. So for instance, uh, the C1 cell here would not be accessible anymore. And uh, the C2 cell uh, neither because each time the, the dispersal path uh, is, is blocked by, by a barrier. Of course, in the case of the C2 cell, maybe in, in more than one dispersal event, you can still, you will still manage to, to get there because eventually uh, you will be able to, to work around the, around the barrier, which is not the case of the, of the C1 cell here. And also worth uh, noting is that uh, barriers do not uh, block long distance dispersal. Only the, the regular dispersal is, is affected because we choose to do it in that way because <clears throat> basically the, the long distance dispersal is, is to model non-standard uh, and very random dispersal events. So, so there is no reason that they, they are blocked by, by barriers. Here's an example of, of uh, what is the uh, proper good production potential that I mentioned before. Um, basically, the, the idea is that for each uh, cell age, so what I say A, when I say age here, it's actually uh, the number of dispersal events uh, since a given cell became colonized. So for each age of the cell, uh, you can give a, uh, associate a certain uh, probability of the cell uh, being able to to produce propagules. Uh, for instance, here you can see on the on the left hand side, uh, maybe <clears throat> the first year after a cell it's it's is being colonized, its probability to to produce propagules is is really low. It's maybe only point point oh five, and uh, it will gradually increase uh, to reach its maximum of one after five years. Once the maximum is reached. It will it will stay there. On the right is another example is similar, but in that case we, we add a, a delay of, of five years uh, before the the cell even uh, starts to to produce uh, proper growth. So that can be useful, for instance, if I don't know you're modeling a, a tree species and and this uh, tree species uh, will take a number of years before it, it starts to to produce seeds. Oh, sorry, there was a uh, caption here. Um, okay, so uh, seed production uh, potential is, uh, you see it now here in the, this is our the equation to, to compute the probability of colonization of a cell. And uh, this is where uh, this uh, uh, propagule production probability uh, affects uh, the probability of a cell to become uh, colonized. Uh, before uh, moving on to the hands-on example, I also want to, to mention some of the limitations and the problems that you encounter where, uh, when using MICM. So, so really the, <clears throat> the most, uh, I would say, difficult uh, thing when you're using uh, MICM is, is that the basic model, uh, the basic unit, sorry, of the model uh, is a cell, uh, so a pixel of, of your grid. And basically, you, you could see this uh, this basic unit as a as a population. So this means that when you calibrate your model, so for instance, a dispersal kernel or the probability uh, to produce a long distance dispersal event or the probability uh, for propagule production, um, <clears throat> you should, in theory, uh, calibrate this uh, as if it corresponds to to a population or to a cell and, and not an, an individual. Of course, uh, the problem with that is uh, that when you look in the literature, you often, I mean, it's already hard enough to, to find um, uh, to find information on uh, dispersal parameters for, for a given species. And but when you find it, it's usually for, for an individual and, and not for a whole uh, population. So, uh, that is is uh, clearly one uh, one of the issues that that you face when when using MICLIM. 
Uh, you can have a look at the, the two papers that I mentioned here on the bottom, and you will find some some guidelines of on how we could uh, how you could, for instance, uh, convert a dispersal kernel for uh, an individual to uh, a kernel for a, a whole uh, population or a whole whole cell. And the uh, second, another limitation that is kind of linked to to that first one is that. Uh, so in Micklin, there is no real uh, within cell, uh, say, population dynamics. Uh, so for instance, within a cell, uh, we do not uh, keep track of uh, how many individuals we have, or for instance, uh, that there might be an age structure within a, within a cell. So there are other, other um, models, for instance, where, where they would keep track uh, within a cell, like there are, I don't know, so, so, so many and so many uh, um, individuals with, which are in this uh, age class and so, so many and so many that are in, in that age class so uh, so in Miklim you don't you don't find uh, this sort of uh, population uh, dynamics parameters okay so now we move on to the hands-on example and for before uh, running uh, the simulations in, in R we just have a look at the at the different in at the sorry at the function how it how it looks like uh, I try to get um, yeah I try to do this quickly because I see that we are running out of time um, okay so in in the miclim uh, package you have uh, three main functions which are the migrate function the plot function and the user guide function uh, so miclim dot migrate is is really the main function that you want to to run your simulations, uh, the plot function is just to to plot your output, and the user guide just displays the user guide. Um, so here's a, how the the main function looks like. So you have all uh, the different inputs here that you need to run a simulation. So uh, you have your initial distribution. So this has to be a, a raster uh, type. There are different uh, formats that are supported. But uh, what I want to emphasize here is that actually the um, the value that you pass uh, to these uh, parameters is not a raster object. So you don't load your raster into R, but the thing that you pass is simply uh, so a string here, which is uh, the name of uh, your raster file as it is uh, on your disk. So you when you run Miklim, you don't need to, to load all your your uh, so your initial distribution and your suitability maps. You don't need to load them into R, but you simply pass here the name uh, that they have to the function. Next parameters are the suitability maps. So um, again, you don't uh, pass uh, uh, a raster object here. You only pass uh, the name of the of, the, of your raster uh, grid as it's on your hard drive. And as we discussed before, you can have, uh, sometimes in a simulation, you want to have uh, more than one uh, suitability map. So how do you pass that to the function? Well, basically all your map need to have uh, the same common base name. So in this case, for instance, they should all be called the uh, uh, HS map for habitat suitability map. And then you have to number them in the right order. So you first, the map that will be first used uh, would be uh, HS map one, and the maps that will be loaded in the second environmental change step should be named HS map two, HS map three, and uh, so forth. So you really have to uh, to stick uh, to this uh, naming uh, scheme. Of course, the the HS map uh, part you can replace with anything you like. But uh, you really have to to put the numbers one, two, three, four, and and so on. Otherwise, it's uh, not going to work. Uh, next is a reclassification uh, threshold. Uh, so here, the idea I think I have. Uh, oh, sorry, no. I thought I had a graphic to illustrate that. But basically, the idea is uh, is. Um, that uh, you want to use to uh, reclassify your your 
uh, habitat suitably maps. Uh, so for instance, say you you obtain a suitability uh, projection in the range uh, zero to 2000, so where zero would be 0% 0 uh, suitability and 1000 would be 100% uh, suitability. Maybe you want, I mean, there are many cases where you don't want to use uh, this uh, continuous uh, range of values, but you want to reclassify your values into either uh, the habitat is suitable or not. So this is where you can use this uh, reclassification uh, threshold. So basically, either you set this threshold to a value that will uh, split your habitat suitability into suitable and unsuitable, or you set it to zero. And if you set it to zero, then what happens is that the, the suitability uh, value that is in your habitat suitability map uh, is going to be used in to compute the, the probability of colonization of a cell and uh, basically uh, the idea is that so you can you can use this information to say okay this this cell is more likely to be colonized than another cell uh, because its its habitat is is more favorable then you have uh, the environmental steps and the dispersal steps uh, so i think this is uh, we already discussed this uh, quite in in details what is important is is that your number of environmental change step has to match uh, with the number of uh, uh, habitat suitability maps that you have on on disk uh, then you give the the dispersal kernel so basically you have you give the probability between zero and one uh, for each distance class so here it would be a kernel for uh, for for a species that can disperse up to uh, two a distance of up to two pixels Um, <clears throat> here you can, if we go back to, to this uh, figure here, you can see the, the kernels that would be associated to, I mean, how you, you would uh, write the kernel, this dispersal kernel here. So see for the first class, you would have a dispersal probability of one, for the second, uh, 0.4, for the third, uh, 0.16, uh, 0.06, and 0.03. Whereas for this, uh, very simple kernel, you would have a probability of one for each of your five distance class. And so <clears throat> the input is simply a vector of uh, five times one. Uh, next, you have the uh, long distance dispersal uh, options. So either if you don't want to implement this, you just leave the frequency to, to zero and nothing is gonna happen. Uh, if you want to impl implement, implement it, then you, you give a certain frequency here. You give a uh, minimum distance and a maximum distance. Again, uh, the, the distance units, as always in, in MCLIM, the uh, pixel units, so cells. So if you have a spatial resolution of 100 meters and you want to spe uh, your species to disperse, say, up to one kilometer, you would give a maximum distance of 10. And uh, finally, we have here the, the barrier. Um, input parameter so here is where you you give your um, your uh, barrier raster again you just pass the name and not the not the raster object and what i didn't mention so far is you have two types of of uh, barriers so they can be what you call strong or, or weak um, the difference is it's not really big it's, it's simply that uh, if you have a you have your barrier here the the gray and black uh, striped pixels and you have your uh, occupied cells here that can disperse and your unoccupied but suitable cells in, in light green. So in the case of a strong barrier, um, for instance, your species could not disperse along the, the blue arrows. Whereas if you put a weak barrier, it, it would still be allowed to, to disperse. You can see that kind of uh, border case where, where you could, depending on, on what you're modeling and what your type of uh, barrier input, uh, you could choose between these uh, these two types. Uh, and finally, there's one more parameter <laughs> that is important: is uh, you can give uh, the initial age uh, at which your uh, species can start to produce uh, propagules, and you can give a vector of uh, how this uh, uh, probability. Uh, 
increases or varies uh, with with time. Uh, basically, it's just yeah. I think the the most important is, is to remember that the uh, cell age is is measured in a dispersal event uh, step. So each time you have a dispersal event, uh, we uh, we increase uh, the age of of each cell uh, by by one. And usually, what you what you will want to do is you will want to uh, to run your modeling so that the, the dispersal each dispersal event basically corresponds to to a year. And here again, you have here's how you would write these uh, two uh, kernels. Um, okay, so now we'll uh, move to an example into R. If you are doing this uh, tutorial. Uh, if you want to do this uh, this example, you can you can download the, the data with the, the two links here. I think I also uh, put them on the Google Plus Plus page of the of the seminar, so you can also simply copy and paste uh, from there. And um, I remind you that you have the possibility to to send your your questions now or post them on on Google Plus. And here I just uh, tell you briefly the uh, what we're gonna uh, run as a as a simulation. So we're gonna make we're gonna do a dispersal over 50 years, so from 2001 to 2050, and we're gonna implement uh, a change in the environment every five years. So we're gonna have 10 environmental change steps, and within each of these steps, we're gonna have uh, five dispersal steps. Um, so if you do 10 uh, times 5, you obtain the 50 years that we have here from 2001 to 2015. Uh, the study area of the, the test data, you can you will recognize this, uh, this shape. It's, uh, so it's basically this is uh, the study area where we often uh, work um, where the group of uh, Antoine Guizon uh, often works. So we have a lot of data for this, this study area. So this is what we we often run uh, models for, for that location. Uh, as you can see, if you're familiar with the shape of Switzerland here, it's uh, at the eastern end of the, the Geneva Lake. And if you want to see a 3D view, it looks uh, a bit like this. I think I, I, had a, I did a slight uh, vertical acceleration. It looks really steep here. Uh, and the spatial resolution at which we're going to run the modeling is, is 100 meters. Uh, of course, you can go, we could uh, have a, use a finer resolution. The main reason here that we, we use 100 meters is, is so that the, the data, that simulation will, will run quickly for, for this example. Um, okay, so let me switch. So for a second, uh, just uh, while I prepare uh, my R session, um, so if you have some question now, you can you can already ask them. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you if you had some some comments or questions. I think keep going, but you're doing great. This is okay. okay. Thank you. All right, so I'm going back. Uh, to screen share mode. And uh, so here's a, an R session in uh, R Studio. I guess most of you will be quite familiar with this, uh, with this environment. And uh, so now let's uh, go through this, uh, this short uh, tutorial. So the first thing you want to do is uh, install the, the package if, you've, uh, if you haven't already done it. I've already done it, so I'm not going to do it again. Uh, then you can uh, load uh, your live, your the Nikim, uh, package. As you can see, it will. Uh, okay, that's a highlight. Uh, it will load a number of uh, other uh, packages that are, that are required. And then, uh, if you type uh, here two comments, uh, we can get help uh, for the for the package. Uh, for instance, here you can uh, display all the all the functions uh, from the package, or uh, you can request help, uh, display the help 
for a particular function. Uh, but in fact, uh, what I would really uh, recommend uh, to you if, if it's the first time that you're using in it, using uh, Miklim is, is to have a look at the user guide. So if you type uh, miklim.user guide, it will open a, a new window with a, with a PDF file. And here you can, you can read all uh, the details about how to, how to use it. Uh, I think it's, is a uh, quite complete, and uh, <clears throat> I think it's it's uh, really uh, worth reading if it's even if it's uh, it's a fairly uh, long document. Okay, uh, so I'm setting um, I'm now setting my working directory. I've downloaded a, a tutorial file. Let's have a look. Sorry. Um, okay, so I, I created a, a folder here um, with my for running the, the tutorial. Uh, I have this is a, the zip file um, for the tutorial. In theory, uh, I, sh I should have already uh, unzipped it. Sorry, uh, if you just installed, if you just downloaded it, then you wouldn't have all this. Uh, this uh, what is contained in the in the zip file, and I also have the the heel shade here, but this is you you're not gonna have it in in your in your folder. All right, so you can go ahead and unzip the, the zip file here, so you obtain all this the individual uh, habitat suitability map. Here you can see from one to ten. So this is the map for 2005, 2010, 15, and so on until uh, 2050. We have a uh, the initial distribution of the, of the species here, and also uh, one grid, uh, which is uh, the barrier uh, raster. Uh, here you can uh, load your data if you want to, to have a look at it. Uh, for instance, here we have our uh, species uh, initial uh, distribution. So we see, sorry, in in dark blue, we have uh, the uh, cell that are, where the species is present, and in gray, so the value is zero, is uh, the cells where the species is absent at the beginning of the simulation. And then we have all of our uh, habitat suitability maps. Uh, again, I'm just going to show you how they look like. Sorry, it takes takes a little while to, to load it. Uh, just remember that here I you saw that I I loaded the uh, the rasters with the with the raster uh, function from the raster package. Uh, but again, this is just uh, because I I want to to display the rasters now. When we actually run uh, Miklim, we don't need to to load these uh, rasters into into memory. Okay. All right, so here you can see, sorry about that. All right, here we are. You can see the, the 10 uh, habitat suitability maps. And basically you can see uh, how the suitable habitat, which is shown in, uh, in dark red, um, you can see how it's. You feel that it's it's moving a bit uh, eastwards. Or actually, it's it's a um, so suitable habitat is is uh, moving up in uh, in elevation along the the mountain. But here you have the the lake and the the Rhone Valley here on the on the left uh, bottom. So these are the different habitat suitability maps input. And finally, we also have. Uh, Barrier file that uh, we can uh, just quickly have a look at. Here it is. Okay, that loads quickly. So it's simply a, a binary raster. You have uh, values of one that indicate uh, cells that are a uh, barrier to dispersal. So the species cannot disperse across uh, these cells. And you have uh, gray cells uh, that are non barrier. So 
this uh, species can, can disperse across uh, these cells. Okay, so I, here my memory, I, I remove all the raster objects from, from memory because I, I don't need, need them. And um, now I'm gonna run a first uh, simulation. Uh, so here you have the, uh, the Miklin that uh, migrate function. And what you can see here is uh, that for this first uh, test, I put test mode equals true, which means that uh, basically all it will do is will simply like uh, check that all my inputs are okay but without really uh, running the, the simulation. So the reason why this is useful is, is mostly say if you if you want to carry out a, a lot of, of uh, different uh, simulations and um, you know it's going to take a long time maybe it's going to take a day or two days and you don't want to to have your your simulation crash uh, in the middle of the of the night just uh, because you you made a typo in the input so if you run it with test mode equal true it, it will run really quickly just just do a test. And uh, if it passes, then you can run the, the actual uh, simulation. Um, so you can see my different parameters. So uh, <coughs> for in, for initdist, I give my uh, initial distribution raster, which is called simply initial disk. I, I enter that name here. My habitat suitability maps are all called HS map and with a number. So the base name is HS map, and I enter that here. Uh, I want to reclassify them uh, with 500, which means because my input uh, is between uh, my suitability maps, uh, values are either uh, zero or thousand. Uh, so what I want to sell it, say here is that uh, values of uh, zero are unsuitable and the values of thousand are suitable. So I just put 500 as a threshold, but of course I could also put 200. In that case, it would be the, the same. It's just to, to split uh, these two values. Uh, we have 10 environmental change steps here. So for each step, I have a different map, as you can see here, from one to 10. Um, the number of dispersal steps is five, because uh, within each uh, environmental change loop, I want to run uh, five uh, dispersal loops. So if you multiply 10, 10 by five, you obtain the 50 years of our uh, simulation. The dispersal kernel here is, is really easy. Uh, it's it's very simple. Basically, we just uh, allow the species to disperse at a distance of uh, one uh, pixel, one cell. And uh, we set it to one, which means that um, a cell that is located uh, next to uh, an occupied cell has a 100% chance to, to become occupied. Uh, you can set your the barrier layer to, to the barrier raster here. Uh, I set the initial age for uh, producing propagules to one. This means that immediately after a cell became occupied, it is able to, to produce propagules. And it does so uh, with a 100% uh, probability. I set uh, long distance dispersal to, to zero. Uh, so there won't be any uh, long distance dispersal in that uh, simulation. All right, and of course, then you can give a name uh, to your simulation. You can also uh, do more than one replicate. Uh, this can be useful. Uh, say maybe you want if you are, you have some uh, um, a probabilistic dispersal kernel and also maybe a, a long distance dispersal frequency that is not zero. So every simulation is going to be a little bit different. So maybe you want to do I don't know like a hundred uh, replicates and then average output, so this allows you to do this easily, just, just set 100 here and you have 100 replicates. Okay, so if I run this, because I set uh, test mode equal, equal true, um, it will basically just tell me that the, the test for uh, test run one completed uh, successfully. But it didn't do it. I mean, it didn't do any uh, actual uh, dispersal simulation. And now I do the same simulation, but I set it to test mode to false. <coughs> and now it should uh, run the simulation exactly. So 
because uh, the dispersal canal is, is really small, the whole simulation was, was really quick, it's already completed. And if I go into my working directory, now I can see that I have a task run one uh, directory where all the outputs uh, for my for this run uh, are stored. Um, so with making plot, you can you can plot your output. So here you can you can have a look at, at the result. Unfortunately. Uh, it's been a while since I, I designed this function, and, and I think nowadays you can do a much <laughs> nicer plot than that. So when I have some time, I'll, I'll definitely uh, update that function. Um, you have a summary file. Let me just display that. Uh, OK, so you can, in the summary, you can see um, the number of cells, uh, for instance, uh, that were in your initial distribution. Um, the number of cells that are projected to to become um, occupied in the case of no dispersal uh, in, a, in a no dispersal uh, simulation or in a unlimited dispersal, and this is the number of cells that become occupied effectively occupied in your uh, simulation as you as you run it, and you have a, a number of additional. Uh, values such as uh, how many cells became colonized, how many became uncolonized, how many uh, long distance uh, dispersal events happened, and the runtime of your, your simulation. If you look at the stats file, you have the, the same kind of values, but this time uh, you have it for for each each year of your simulation. So we have 50, 50 rows here, 51 with the initial state. Uh, so basically, each each row here corresponds to a to one uh, one year in our our simulation, and uh, it will it will give you again uh, the number of uh, cells for I mean yeah how many were colonized uh, decolonized and so on at each uh, at each step. Okay, I think I had I had more uh, simulations here. Maybe we just because we're a bit short on time, uh, so we're just gonna run also maybe the last one here. So in that one, uh, basically the difference is that now I have a, a longer dispersal kernel, and you can see the, the probability of uh, of uh, dispersing a seed to each distance is is decreasing with with distance. Uh, I've also added uh, here um, a vector for uh, propagule production potential. So for instance, in the first year after a cell is colonized, you can see the, the probability to, to produce propagule is only of uh, 1%, so it's very low. And it will reach 100% after one, two, three, four, five years. And I've also added, uh, a uh, frequency of 5% uh, to produce a long distance dispersal. Again, uh, the simulation completed, and if I go into my working directory, I can see now I have a test run four um, folder that contains my result. Uh, here, I just I just quickly show you uh, the results in in an arc uh, map project that I that I did that I prepared. Uh, because so you can you can see a little bit better than in the results than in, in R. Okay, so here you have you you, you recognize the study area. Uh, this is why I have the hill shade uh, raster, so you can uh, nicely have a kind of uh, 3D effect. And now I can load. Uh, here is uh, my test run one. So you see the the output values of the of the rasters. So negative values uh, would mean the cells that were occupied at a certain time, but uh, that became uh, decolonized because the habitat uh, became uh, unsuitable um, over time. And then you have uh, zero is for cells that uh, are simply empty; they never became colonized because they, they are not uh, suitable. Uh, blue cells is your the cells that uh, belong to 
to the initial distribution of your species. So in, in blue, you can see all the cells uh, that were suitable at the beginning and that are still occupied at the end. And then basically you can see uh, a large number of, of values and each of these uh, values is uh, coded to correspond to a certain uh, dispersal and environmental change step. <clears throat> so the, the coding is basically that the, the environmental change step is multiplied by 100 and then you add uh, the dispersal step number. So for instance, you have 101. It means uh, this corresponds to pixels that were uh, colonized during the first dispersal step of the first uh, environmental change step. Uh, 105 would be the pixel that became colonized uh, during the fifth uh, dispersal step of the first environmental change step. And because we had uh, five dispersal steps within each environmental change step, you can see that uh, the numbers here always go from one to five, and then we go to 200, 201, 205, 300. It means now it's a third um, environmental change step. And again, uh, the numbers go from 301 to 305. So basically, the idea is that with, uh, with these numbers here, you can, you can know exactly when each cell uh, became uh, colonized uh, during your simulation. And you'll be able to, to reconstitute exactly uh, the, the timeline of, of when each uh, cell became occupied. And the 30,000 uh, value here is simply to, to indicate uh, cells that are suitable, but that could not be uh, colonized because the species was unable to, to disperse. So for instance, here, if I zoom in a bit, um, uh, you would see that this uh, whole uh, purple patch um, uh, was not uh, colonized by the species, either because here you can see uh, there is a gap of, uh, say, four, four or five pixels. So the species was not able to, <coughs> to, to jump from here to here. Because uh, if you remember, I use a dispersal distance of, of just uh, one pixel. Oh, sorry, actually, there is only one, one uh, pixel distance here. It's, uh, because the hill shade has a, has a five meter, uh, sorry, a 25 meter resolution. This is why you see all these, uh, these small cells. Or in the case of here, you can see the, the purple area is connected here. But what happened here is, is that uh, if I check out the value of uh, these cells here, I can see uh, they have a value of uh, 1,005, uh, which means there are the cells that were uh, colonized, during, colonized during the last, last step of my simulation. And basically, it means that uh, within the 50-year time frame, uh, my species was not able to, uh, to go further than uh, than this location here. Um, okay, so let's, this was uh, the first, and if we look at the, this is the second simulation around, so this time I added uh, barriers that we see here in green. And again, if you, for instance, if we zoom around here, uh, this time I think I had a dispersal distance of up to five pixels, so you can see that, uh, even though these pixels here in purple, for instance, are within uh, five pixel distance, uh, they were not colonized because um, because of the bar the barrier impeded uh, the dispersal. And sometimes uh, we also, for instance, here this patch here, you can see that uh, even though it's uh, is separated uh, from the rest by a uh, by the barrier cells. It's still occupied, probably because uh, it was colonized with a with a long distance uh, dispersal event. Um, okay, I think uh, I'm going to stop here because I've largely overshot uh, the time already. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me go back. Here, my last slide. So, just here is uh, where you can find uh, more information. So, you, your first uh, first place to look for is would be the, the user guide. Uh, you can also um, send me an email if you have some some problem or put a post on, on Google Plus. Um, there's also a GitHub uh, 
website for for MiniClaim, where you can also uh, you can also I mean, either download the source code, but you can also simply download it from Cran. Uh, but here you can also uh, post if you have uh, problems. Also. Okay, so with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm I'm really sorry that it took <laughs> quite a long a long time. And uh, if you have some questions for those that are not asleep yet, uh, you can uh, send them uh, to town via this uh, biodiv training at gmail.com. Uh, email address or uh, post them on, on Google Plus and we can answer them. Uh, I can answer them either uh, now if you already have some questions or uh, later uh, if you if they are posted on, on Google Plus I can also answer them in the in the next uh, few days. Okay let me go back here. And now, thank you, Robin. Oh, okay. Okay. So now I, I no, was great. Yes. I, and indeed, your your apologies are completely unnecessary because your detailed explanation and example were very much appreciated. You've got several big fans here in my lab now. Um, <laughs> I have two thank questions you. for you already. Um, not from me. Um, first of all, from Rob Anderson, who's a professor at the, the City College of New York. Uh, he says, uh, very clear presentation and great R package. Thank you. Uh, question for you. For real world applications, especially for tropical species, we seldom know the dispersal kernel or the long distance dispersal probability with much certainty. The same applies to demographic parameters such as time to produce propagules and propagule production potential. For such species, we'll probably have to borrow from data for related species. Have you or have others conducted sensitivity analyses to estimate how much the conclusions depend on getting the dispersal and demographic values correct. Mm, okay, I see. Okay, yeah. I see. Yeah. So, so, oh, sorry. Do oh, you have some? Oh, some oh, 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 just me. I'm sorry. Because uh, uh, I hear a lot of echoes. No, I'll cut off my yeah. my microphone. Uh, okay. So, so basically. Uh, the question is how how sensitive are the results to to having the the correct uh, dispersal parameters? Um, well, I, I haven't to be honest, I haven't uh, carried out uh, like a, like say um, very realistic. Uh, I mean, I, I I did this kind of. Uh, Sensitive analysis, uh, maybe uh, as tests, but I haven't uh, really uh, done one. I think uh, very formally yet. Uh, what uh, what we have done, for instance, is uh, is to what I what I showed in the beginning, where we see the difference say, between uh, no dispersal, unlimited dispersal, and uh, some sort of uh, uh, dispersal that we could. Uh, Infer from uh, from literature data. So, for instance, in the case of uh, when I was um, talking before this uh, this study where we had uh, 280 species, of course, we it was uh, completely impossible to to get uh, accurate data for for all these uh, species. Uh, so, basically, what we what we've done in that case uh, is that we <coughs> we grouped uh, we associated each uh, species. To a certain uh, dispersal type based on its uh, morphology and how the old plant species so based based on uh, how for instance how tall it is on what type of um, uh, seeds it, it produces on what is the main uh, dispersal vector is it uh, through animals or is it uh, through wind for instance so we we grouped uh, our species into into this kind of uh, rough category. And then for uh, for each uh, species, uh, we we had a kind of a maximum uh, 
this postal distance. So <clears throat> what I would say is that uh, even if you even if you don't uh, have a very accurate uh, data to this postal data, and, and in most cases it's what is going to happen because because there are very few species uh, for which uh, you would uh, know the yeah like precisely the frequency of uh, of a long distance dispersal or or even precisely the maximum uh, dispersal uh, dispersal distance. So so basically in, yeah in, in this kind of uh, uh, for these cases uh, you. You could uh, decide that uh, okay, you you know you know, uh, for instance, you your species is uh, uh, sorry, you know that your species is going to dispose at most say uh, I don't know like one kilometer uh, per year. So in this case, you just make a, a dispersal kernel where where all the probabilities are set to one uh, from uh, from zero to to uh, one kilometers. And, and you use this as a uh, as a rough uh, dispersal kernel because you don't have the the precise uh, probabilities for each each uh, distance class. Um, um, so I, yeah, so I, yeah. I don't know if this answers uh, the questions, the questions, but I think but I think as a um, one one user one, one user uh, uh, like uh, Miklim is is also to to be able to to run your your own uh, uh, sensitivity, sensitivity uh, analysis and and maybe yeah if you don't have if you don't have uh, precise data maybe you could uh, you could try uh, two or three uh, uh, dispersal uh, distances uh, that you can uh, sort of uh, guess uh, or which either from literature of which from your experience uh, seem reasonable and uh, and you can see how they how they impact your uh, your simulation and in particular you could, uh, you could see how how it can be I mean whether the, the results are, are very different from using say a limited dispersal or, or no dispersal at all okay then one last question for you um, this is from Angela Cuervo who is from Colombia, but she's she's resident in Mexico at the moment. Um, and she asks, Robin, is it possible to use both strong and weak barriers at the same time? Um, at the same time, uh, no, but I don't really, I mean, I don't really see in which scenario you would you would want to use them at the same time. Uh, I mean, you could you could run two two different simulations, one with the strong and one with the weak, and you could you could compare the the results. Uh, but within one simulation, no, it is not possible to to have both. Uh, but I don't really, I don't maybe I'm, I'm missing it, but I don't really see the the scenario where where this would be would be useful. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, but if, if she has some, she has some, some specific, some specific uh, nice, uh, nice, welcome to, welcome to send me an, an email, an email, and I can help. I can help. For this, for this, for this, for this problem. problem. Okay. Well, uh, Robin, thank you very, very much. It's been a great seminar, and I'm sure uh, the the hands-on and immediate utility will be very much appreciated. I'm kind of looking around the room here and already seeing a project where MIGCLIM could be incorporated immediately. Um, so I'll thank you and I think everybody here thanks you and I'm, I'm sure there are several hundred people around the world who are also grateful. Uh, thanks for your time and uh, much appreciated. And um, to everybody, I will be announcing the 18th seminar quite soon. Uh, we're we're just pinning down a title, so uh, that'll be announced quite soon. So, no, well, thank you, Tanon. Thanks, Tanon. Thanks, everybody, everybody who has been watching. Been watching. And as I said, and as I said, I said welcome, welcome, welcome to welcome to post, uh, post more, uh, more questions, or if you have problems, you have problems, to run as a, as a, as a, as a uh, feel free to <coughs> to post a question or uh, and uh, and uh, Thank you very much Thank again. Thank you very much for again for thanking me. Thanking me. Um, and, uh, I hope uh, I hope it was useful.
was useful. It was great. Thank you, Robin. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.